budget process. At the commission meeting, and uh, I, I, I understood the, uh, the concerns that were voiced about the importance of having a line item budget, but uh, I also uh, want to be sensitive to the concerns of not trying to uh, micromanage and in the process uh, make it impossible for uh, the library team to do their work. And so I just asked Randy, I, we had a brief informal conversation about how other agencies typically manage their budgets and also in terms of the guidance that he might give to our committee about what we should be looking at. And he referred to uh, a concept that I'll call financial controls at the character level. And so before I, I blunder and say something I shouldn't, Randy, I'm gonna ask you if you would just uh, say a few words to the uh, committee uh, about this topic that you and I discussed uh, the other day on the phone. I would be happy to, and I will do my very best to keep it brief. Um, the, the, the character level um, that, that you mentioned are basically are the three primary categories of expenses that we see pretty much for any department or entity that we work with in the county. Um, and I know that they've been discussed before we're talking about salaries and benefits is a primary uh, expenditure of categories, services and supplies, and capital expenses. And the way the county does their appropriation control is at that level. So every line item, every account within each one of those characters, as we call them, um, the line item budget can be exceeded in one line item if it un comes under in a different one. As long as you don't exceed the overall budget in one of those characters, you are able to proceed as you see fit. Um, the appropriation control comes into play when let's say you under budgeted for your salaries and benefits and you need, a, you need additional appropriations for that. At that point in time, um, you would need to uh, get approval to actually move budget from say your service and supplies into um, your salaries and benefits or vice versa. That's, that's essentially a, 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 an overview of how the appropriation control works at the county level. So uh, I wanted to just follow this up uh, with a question, if I could, because um, what, what that says to me is, uh, um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm reminded, uh, uh, those of you in the library business, I think will appreciate this. I'm reminded by, about something that uh, one of my junior high school English teachers told me about understanding literature. And she argued against uh, what she called the speleological theory of literary interpretation, where you would pick some obscure element in the text and then try to dive down to figure out what it meant uh, symbolically. And what, what she said is, you know, in a good work of literature, what seems most important is most important. And it, it seems to me that the, the, the corollary here is that the summary page that we get is the one that we should focus the most scrutiny on, that, that if we are within budget in those three characters, if we're within our budget on salary and benefits, and we're within our budget on services and supplies, and if we're within our, our budget on capital expenses, overall we're doing Okay, and we can always look at individual line items to see, gee, why is something higher than it was expected to be? But ultimately, it, it's not, uh, not a good use of our time or uh, of management time to focus too much on an individual line item if the category as a whole is managed effectively. Is that the conclusion you would ask us to take away from this, Randy? I'm perfectly put. That's, that's exactly how I would put it. Um, the, the way that summary page was created was was broken down into those three primary categories. And um, you may notice when, when we do bring that up that, that the service and supplies is broken down further into like the top five categories just for, for additional information. But right. absolutely, I, I would recommend that when there's reports are reviewed, it's at that higher macro level approach. Um, you don't need to dig into the details unless it looks like there's something of concern 
and then those details absolutely are available. Now, to, to go one step further, Randy, at, at the county agencies that you work with, do they, do they still construct their overall budget uh, at a line item basis? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, done exactly the same way that the, the budget workbook that was provided yeah. to commissioners. That's exactly the way that, that all departments put their budgets together um, at that ground level. So it sounds like we have a, a very detailed bottom-up process for creating the budget. But once the budget is together, it, it makes, uh, makes sense for, to give the managers the latitude they need to manage services and supplies, for example, and not to get too hung up on, gee, we're over in one particular item. I think it's worthwhile to note that. Uh, particularly as we're preparing the budget for the next year. But uh, I, I think it's worth, worth us all keeping in mind the, the value and importance of focusing at that higher level. Any, any questions or additional comments on this for uh, Randy? We have Commissioner Hauser. Um, I don't have a question for Randy. I have... I wanna thank you for clarifying this for all the commission commissioners. And I think this needs to be repeated again at our next meeting. Um, and it might be good to write a paragraph or two describing it. So we have some kind of record like a, 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 a that we can follow going forward in the future years and so forth. So we have our little written procedure, we might call it. Thank you. I think that's a great uh, comment. And um, Jaylene, if, if you will please be sure to note that in the minutes, uh, I'll take it as a to-do item and I'll do a draft, which I will, uh, Randy, I'll probably ask you to review and make sure I have not misrepresented anything, okay? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions or comments? We have Commissioner McKenzie. Barbara, yeah. Yes, Tom brought up, uh, I actually had this, uh, my suggestion, uh, he touched on it by writing the paragraph. I believe that we actually need a policy document about our, our budgeting, uh, which would include what we mean by flexible budgeting. And I know that that's a topic later on, but it would include, um, uh, you know, just more details. I, when we got kind of got dropped in on this, you know, all of a sudden we're going to do it fl flexibly. I think I just missed some meeting or some, some topic of conversation where we just kind of jumped into this new concept and it needs to be spelled out and because we aren't going to all be on the commission forever. So I believe it should be a policy document called something like, um, you know, our internal policy on budgeting. So I had that down to request that we could review possibly at the next finance committee meeting. And um, anyway, I, I second that, but it needs to be kind of a formal policy, I believe. Thank you. That's a, I think that's a great point. And uh, I'll, I'll do, I'm gonna write that as a, as a takeaway. Uh, Cause you're right, we won't all be here forever. Okay. Um, so with this uh, as background, I think it, let's, let's jump into the financial reports. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Ann and Randy to please, uh, let's, let's focus, I think, appropriately on the summary here. And if you could just uh, uh, give us a big picture of where we are right now. Want to take that, Randy? Would you like me to start? Um, I'd be happy to start. And you can fill in any holes if uh, any appear. Um, so I'm, I, I believe the summary page is up. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so first, uh, focus on the revenues. Um, uh, so it's property tax. We had another $600,000 coming in May. So our year to date is at 21.6 million. Um, this is in comparison to last year's total of 21.4. So we're still well ahead of last year's pace for property taxes, which is excellent. Um, and then on the sales tax, uh, we are very steady. Uh, 1.1 million, it seems to be the average. Um, and that is also what we're projecting for June in which we're going, going to end up recognizing three months for June. 
Um, so we'll, we should have another $3.3 million added to that year-to-date total. So we'll be uh, over over $13.4 million, close to $13.5 million for the year um, is what we'll ultimately end up recognizing. Any questions on the revenue side? Well, that certainly seems like good news uh, compared to what we were fearful of when we did the budget last year. And uh, we're going to exceed uh, our our actuals for last year. We're certainly going to exceed our our overall budget for revenue. Um, so I, I'm very, very happy to see that. Um, on the expense side, uh, salaries and benefits, um, we're currently at 16.4 million. Last year at this time, we were at 17. Um, in fairness, we have processed a, a couple more pay periods this year as compared to last, but on a percentage basis, we're right in line. Um, no, no fears of exceeding the budget. Um, so that all looks good. And let me skip down to the services and supplies on the at the macro level, um, we're looking at 7.7 .7 million spent so far this year, 68% um, of the budget. So again, we're, we're right in line with where we should, should be. Um, I don't know if there are any questions about the detail of the five different categories um, that we have broken out, um, maintenance, rents, leases, books, or other contract services. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions if I can on any of that, if there are any. Well, just a just a note. I mean, we're we're eleven twelfths of the year here, right? So we would expect to be uh, at around ninety two percent of uh, budget amount. And really, the only the only category where we're running over is is other contract services, which we've seen all year long. There's no surprise there. Uh, again, this. This seems to me to be a, a, a good news uh, message. And, and that's a fair comment that we are 11 twelfths of the way through the year. The, the one caveat that I would add is that generally uh, during the June, June and what we call the JJ period, which means the three weeks in July in which we're still processing or closing the prior year, there will be a significant amount of, of transactions processed. So that the June period, um, which actually lasts some six or seven weeks, will be much larger than any other month prior. So I wouldn't say that we're 11, 12, 11 12 of the way through our total expenses, but we're, we're probably close. Well, you, Randy, you, you, you raise a good point. Um, you know, our next uh, finance committee meeting is scheduled for uh, July 19th. Do you expect that the year will have closed at that point or will, will you still be processing uh, June activity? The county's books will still be open at that time. We'll be very, very close to being done, but um, there will be some transactions going. And generally what, what we do with our other clients with these monthly reports is we can provide a June 30th interim report, just, just like calendar June 30, with the understanding that we still have um, you know, a couple of weeks of more processing to do as we catch up. You know, there's, there's always going to be invoices that have, have been sitting in someone's drawer for a while or that you know, other vendors or suppliers have not been able to submit to us. Um, so there's, there's a lot of catch up that needs to be done in July that uh, affects June. Okay, but, but we'll have a June interim and, and we should have a, a pretty good sense of what's going on then. Yes, yes. Um, so I, what I'm taking away from you is that even though we're 11 twelfths of the year uh, th through calendar wise, uh, we should not necessarily figure that all of our expenses will reflect that. And in particular, I see that we have 23 pay periods that have posted, and I assume we're going to have 26 at the end. So there will be some additional expenses, but I, I, I feel confident that we're not going to be overrunning uh, anything at the character level. I don't see anything that would uh, raise any cause for alarm at this point. That's correct. Okay, and then the final uh, the final category was just the uh, capital expenses, right? Capital expenses, and and as I think we've discussed previously, we're seeing those those start to ramp up. Uh, we are in construction season, so it's it's a universal thing that you see countywide is your capital expenses tend to go up this time of year. Sure. Well, and also because we were held back so much by by COVID, I'm I'm 
delighted to see that we're finally moving ahead with uh, some of this activity that we've been chomping uh, at the bit to get to. Um, any questions? Uh, thank, thank you both for the summary. Uh, any questions or concerns from the committee? Hearing none, I, I'm going to suggest that we move through the other reports uh, on an exception basis. And for each one, I'm just going to ask the committee if they have any specific comments, questions, or concerns that they would like Randy or Ann to address. Uh, so the next, uh, next report that uh, I'm showing is the cash summary. Comments, questions, concerns. Okay, the uh, statement of special fund activity. Uh, and uh, uh, here we're seeing the sales tax first and then the property tax. Uh, I know you've all had time. By the way, quick question for the committee. How is it working out for you with the printed reports? Is everybody Has everybody been able to get the printed reports in legible form. Can I just hear, Dave, were you? Yes. In fact, I got them much faster than I expected. <clears throat> They're fine. Good. Um, Deborah? Yes, fine. Tom? Yes. Barbara? Got the reports. Uh, I, I still have kind of issues with the presentation, but I also think that when we get um, kind of lengthy additional items in the agenda packet, uh, for example, the CalPERS, it would be great to have those printed out also. Um, I had to print that out myself. And anyway, that's just my suggestion that we kind of take a look at the overall agenda besides the financial reports and see if there's other occasional pieces of the agenda that we would print out and include in the printed packet. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that the reports are printing well. Any, any comments, questions, concerns on the statements of special fund activity? Okay, uh, next is voucher payments over $25,000. Uh, thanks for enlarging that, Jaylene. Any questions on this? Anne, is there anything you'd like to call out for us? I, I was happy to see that both the Roseland refresh and the Central refresh uh, appeared here. Yeah, that's what I was going to call out. We're we're making good progress on both of those, and that's that's welcome news. And I'm assuming that PE refresh is uh, the Petaluma. It is okay. Great. Yeah, really nice to see this activity going ahead. Um, any any questions or concerns for Ann or Randy? Um, Andy, um, I have a question. I think at some time we discussed the possibility of discussing whether we needed to see vouchers that are at the twenty five thousand dollar level, or whether we could we would want to change that to a higher figure. And that's not to be discussed right now. I think it's just that I had in the back of my mind and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that isn't something people wanted to discuss. Well, um, I, I, you know, I, I can, we can make that a discussion item for a next meeting. Uh, if, if you're raising it, Tom, I'm just curious, uh, how do you feel about it personally? Would you, uh, how would you feel if it were raised to 50,000? I think it would be good to have the discussion so uh, we understand why we have this, what the real purpose of this is, this report. Okay. Um, Deborah has a comment. Yeah, please, yeah. Deborah. I um, thought we were probably going to talk about appropriate budget flexibility and this kind of thing um, in 5.6. I just kind of assumed that that was going to be part of that conversation that we might uh because we've talked about this for probably a year a year and a half to uh raise the limit and uh give Anne a little more flexibility but but if I'm jumping the gun um 
uh, I can wait. And if I'm not, then I agree with Tom that we should have we should have some conversation about uh, about raising the limit. Well, it, I'm gonna, whether we're going to raise the limit. Let's let's bring this up when we are discussing item 5.6, but my only caution would be to, to remind everybody, because we did have a discussion about this, that this report shows specific voucher payments over $25,000. It doesn't necessarily show expenses over $25,000. So that if, if, if we had, if we paid uh, somebody and Ann and Randy, please correct me if I have this wrong. But my understanding was that um, if we happen to pay uh, Noel and Tam architects four checks of $15,000 each, they would not appear on this report. Is that correct? Correct. <clears throat> so, um, Let's let's circle back to this, but I'm I'm going to ask you to keep in mind that uh, from uh, from a control perspective, this, I would say this has limited value, given that it's only looking at individual checks over a certain amount. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the next report is the property tax report, which is. You know, as, as Randy was saying earlier, this is something that, you know, we can examine on a line item basis. Uh, as we do that, though, I would ask you to keep in mind two things. Um, one is that control at the character level. But the other is the fact that we might see an expense which seems high on the property tax report, but is much lower and far below budget on the sales tax report. And we had some examples that were reversed. Um, so with that in mind, are there any items that you saw here that you wanted to call out with a specific question or concern to uh, Ann and Randy? Hearing none, I'll ask the same question about the uh, report that follows, which is the sales tax report. Same issue. Any, any items here that were of concern? Okay, thank you. So then we're into um, a detailed look at bequests and uh, gifts and donations. Um, these have been cleaned up and uh, not a lot of activity on a monthly basis. Did you have any question about the bequests? Okay, and how about the gifts and donations? Any questions? All right. Well, uh, again, I'd like to uh, certainly thank the library accounting staff and Randy and his team. Uh, the report seemed to be in, uh, in very good shape. And uh, I'm, I'm feeling comfortable with the uh, timeliness and accuracy of the information that we're getting. Uh, the, the next item is uh, 5.3, the Sonoma County Public Library Foundation Fund. Uh, Randy, can you talk to us about uh, what you did in preparing this place? So this was uh, the, the same process or same format that we use for the, the Kundi Foundation, or I'm sorry, the Kundi um, uh, Reconciliation. We went back through the 1819 fiscal year and just looked at all transactions, um, all donations as far as cash inflows, and then the use of those funds that were coded against the foundation 
to provide a, a, a lot more detail um, to the, the balance that you, that you see on the month report for uh, gifts and donations, there's a line item in there for foundation with that grand total of 106,556 at the very end, the balance. This, this report is just showing how, you know, how we got there from, again, we, we were only going back three years, but it, it kind of trues up or, or, or provides some support to that number that is appearing on the gift and donation tab on the monthly report. Well, thank you very much for doing that. And I'm, I, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the detail-oriented work that's been done in reconciling this. Do we have any, any questions of, for Randy on the uh, foundation summary? Okay, I'm gonna move on to item uh, 5.4, the uh, audit update. How's it going, Randy? What are we hearing from our auditing firm? I wish I had good news for you this month, but unfortunately, we still do not have a completed 1819 audit. Um, I did speak with uh, a gentleman at Episcenium Brinker uh, within the last few weeks, and I mentioned to him the importance of not only completing 1819, but we really need to have 1920 completing the next couple of months um, because, you know, at the county, we're, we're charging very quickly into year end. And then we have um, very strict deadlines for um, county audits. It's gonna take a the time of, of, you know, of my staff. And so we will we'll lose the ability to devote uh, enough time to the library. So he was in agreement. He understood that um, it's, it's of utmost importance that we do get the 1920 completed as well, hopefully before the end of August. Um, as far as the 1819 delay, um, that is primarily still related to um, them having to uh, divert their attention to uh, completing the income tax season. Um, and they, my understanding from speaking to the, the uh, person on my staff that's, that's heading up the audit is that we do have a full draft, um, including notes and, and note statements and the management discussion analysis for the audit. It's just a matter of some of I dotting and T crossing at this point. So fingers crossed, we should be seeing something uh, relatively soon uh, for 1819. And as I mentioned, we will then charge um, full on into getting 1920 done as quickly as we can. So just to clarify, at this point, they're not waiting on anything from us. That's correct. We've, we've answered all of their questions. It's just a matter of them. That they usually have to go through some type of peer review on their end before they, they will issue. Um, so my understanding is that that's where we are. So we should be done quickly. Okay. I, I don't want to put you in an uncomfortable position personally. If, if we had a CFO, would that be the person who would be banging on their desk basically saying we need more attention? Um, that, that's a good way of putting it. Yes. Yeah. That would be the CFO's role to, um, to continue to kind of, uh, you know, make, make sure that the process keeps, keeps moving. Um, so, um, and I certainly don't want to tell you what to do, but now that Erica's on board, um, uh, I hope that between the two of you, one, one of you can, um, exert some additional pressure on them. This seems, uh, it seems like we've just been shuttled to the back burner because we're not important enough or not making enough noise. We will start making noise. Please, I see Dave Cahill raising a hand, Dave. Yeah, I'm not the happiest of campers. Um, Nor am I. This is the second or third time we've been told, well, I'm terribly sorry, but income tax preparation comes first. If they're that short of capacity, um, it seems like we need to get another auditor. Um, this is stupid. We're uh, coming up on almost exactly two years since 2018 and 19 closed. Yes, there was a delay due to our fault, but this is really beyond belief. So I think, I don't know what the process is, but I hope that somebody looks at other auditors who actually will deliver on their promises. I guess first is, it would be nice in our contract with our auditors to have a definite date for product deliverables and then that they actually have to do that. That's a good point. Um, 
Randy, with the various agencies that you support, are there other firms out there besides this one that do audits for them? Um, there are a number of firms um, that, that we deal with directly. We've uh, dealt with a firm called Mays and Associates for the open space audit. Um, there are, uh, we've worked with uh, Macias and Genie in the past. Uh, Pacini and Brinker has been probably the primary auditor that I've worked with over my time with the county. And um, more often than not, are very, very happy with the service they provide. They're usually very, very good um, with their communication. Uh, just sometimes things get bogged down. And I know that's, that's a terrible excuse, but and it's, it's not a legitimate excuse. Um, so um, I, I'm hopeful that they will wrap this one up very quickly. Yeah, and, and look, not, not, not in, in any way intending to put you in the position of having to defend them um, let's just, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, enable Anne and Erica a little bit by, uh, saying that the finance committee is, uh, deeply disturbed by what we're seeing as the, uh, lack of timely service and that, uh, I mean, obviously we're not gonna, we're not gonna pull the audit from them now. But if they if they cannot uh, deliver in a timely fashion, uh, we certainly will be looking at other potential auditors going forward. So please, please uh, threaten or encourage them however you see fit, as well as I'll say. Understood. I will have a conversation with them. Well, OK, well, I, I, I'm not not trying to put you in that spot. I'm going to let you and Ann and Erica decide between the three of you. Who, who's going to be the good guy or the bad guy, however, to do this. We'll figure that part out. And I just to let you all know, too, that uh, this week we'll be meeting with the recruiting firm to get the search for the CFO started. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, anything else on the audit? All right, well, let's move over to uh, item 5.5. And um, again, this, this is a topic that came out, uh, I think, of our, of our budget discussion. Um, and I agree with what you're saying, Barbara, that, uh, that we, we need a, uh, a policy for the Finance Committee and the Commission. Um, at the same time, uh, and what I'm about to say is just based on, on informal conversations, but my understanding is that currently for those uh, managers who have budget responsibility, it may not be that simple for them to obtain timely and accurate information on the expenses that are actually being charged to their department. And uh, again, Randy and I had a brief conversation. It sounded as though within the uh, capabilities of the accounting system that we have, it should be possible to provide uh, these managers and by extension, uh, Anne, with more timely information. Could you talk to us about that and what would be involved in implementing this kind of cost accounting, please, Randy? I'm um, sure. So the, the, the budget that was approved um, recently mentioned that um, the, the, the appropriation control should be done at the division level. And so my big takeaway from this was that I need to look at redoing the monthly reporting that we that we provide for the library. Right now it's done on a fund basis. You know, we're, we're, we're summarizing the primarily the property tax fund and the sales tax fund. And all of these divisions, the, the divisions with the library are all included within those funds, but none of them are called out separately. By virtue of, of what was approved um, as far as a budget, um, we need to know if any of the, those, those divisions, divisions, excuse me, are in danger of exceeding the, uh, the budget that was approved um, for them. And so along those lines, we will be looking at, at coming up with a new format that will go down to the division level that, that I, I believe should be provided to each of the division managers as well 
on a monthly basis to help inform them as to where they stand and they can ask questions and, and look into making any necessary adjustments. Um, so I think it's a good thing. It'll, it'll, it'll increase the amount of uh, information out there that's available. Um, it may take some time to get through the groundwork of getting those prepared, however. The one caveat that I have or, or, or um, caution is that the way that the county system works now is that you know, we would be notified or that or the system will automatically reject any expenses that would exceed the budget at the fund level, as I mentioned. So at the property tax or sales tax level, you can't ex exceed the total budget within those funds. That, that level of control does not exist in the county system at the division level. So there will be no, no, no stopping of, of payments that happen to exceed the budget. That will be up to us from the internal review standpoint to catch those hopefully before they happen. Um, and that if, if they do happen, we'll at least know, know about that by virtue of doing these, this monthly reporting. Okay, so that that's a that, yeah, that's a good point, um, Dave. I see you're raising your hand. Yeah, I want to compliment you and Randy for coming up with this uh, new idea. I did not understand that the managers don't have essentially real time access to the remaining amount in their budget. <laughs> I guess I thought it sort of happened by magic. Um, so I'm pleased to see that we're working toward that end. It seems like there's an important open loop here. It should be closed. Feedback is essential to any manager. So it just, I'm again impressed with what can be done within the county's accounting system. Uh, we discovered this several times over the past uh, year. And so I'm very pleased with how this is all working out. Well, glad, glad to hear that. And of course it hasn't happened yet. Um, uh, Randy is, <laughs> Is this going to require, um, are, 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 are managers going to have to do something different in terms of how they authorize or approve expenses? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to visualize a little bit the mechanics and is this going to create an undue burden on the, on the management team or, or is it something that uh, will not really require a lot of extra time and tension on their part? I would say the latter, that mechanically there, there's no difference with us uh, taking this approach. Um, it, I think it, it does provide the opportunity for managers to be able to you know, look at the, the actual results of their activities on an ongoing basis. And I, I do want to add that um, uh, on top of what Commissioner Cahill said, that the, the county's accounting system does have real time or the, the ability to, to report Report these in, these uh, numbers to at the division level on a real time basis. It's just a matter of training managers on how to use um, what we call um, uh, it's called easy easy simpler is actually is the name of the of the program. It's a, it's a way to get in and look into um, EFS, uh, which is the county's accounting system, and understand how to actually input the different um, coding needed so you can see your division. Uh, activity. That's something that we'll be providing via the monthly reports, but at any time, any point in time, anyone has the ability to go into this system. It is a web-based system and take a look to see how they're doing. Well, I, th I think that that's really should be the goal. I mean, it's, it's great that you'll provide timely reports, but if we really uh, want uh, managers to be able to uh, exercise appropriate fiscal control, then they should have real-time access. And it sounds like it's primarily a training issue. So that would be great. Uh, Barbara, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I think this is obviously a great idea to have this level of, uh, of information for the division managers. My concern remains in this topic and in the broader topic of making sure that we have a clear policy on measure Y expenditures and carving them out from the other expenditures. When we get down to this level of detail, the division managers get their reports, will it have uh, how much is allocated by in, you know, to, to measure Y? And um, I guess that's my primary question. I have some more comments about measure Y after a while. So the, the goal of the reports would be very similar to what we have now for the funds. Um, it would report both the budget and the actual. So what was approved as far as part of the, the overall budget for each division. And then we would, would uh, present what the actual expense 
expenses or uses of that budget have been so far. No, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I heard, but I didn't quite process in terms of the, uh, the, the measure Y concern that, that Barbara's raising. And, and oh. I, I know that there's, there is sometimes a delay in assigning uh, expenses to the measure Y uh, category. How does that happen? That's, that's my, my point all along is we don't seem to have a policy on what is, a, is allocated to measure Y and what's not. And, and I keep bringing this up and this is my concern um, about a written policy for, for measure Y allocations. And um, I'm glad to see it'll be in the reports for the division managers, but I don't ever know how, it, how we allocate it. Ann, do you, do you have any uh, insight on this that you can share to uh, uh, address Barbara's question? Well, I, I think that, I think she's right. We could easily, should have um, a written policy on this. Um, up to now, it's been the responsibility of the CFO to, to make those transfers based on the, the language in Measure Y and things that are appropriate to be so I, I, what I'd like to do is wait until we have the, the new CFO on board and then we can craft a policy, you know, that, that will speak to how we go, how, how, how we make those transfers and, and give some clarity um, to, to the public about this going forward. So it, it, I'm gonna cover some ground that I think we've already covered here, but just for, for my own clarification, it sounded like uh, I, I'm just going to imagine I'm a division manager and I prove an, uh, and I approve an expense. Initially, it's paid with property tax funds, and then there is at a later time a reassignment of part or all of it to Measure Y, depending on appropriate criteria. Is that how it works? That's primarily how it works. Some things we know up front uh, belong in Measure Y uh, because of the experience of, of having done things like that or similar things in the past. But um, primarily it, it is um, at the discretion of the CFO to make sure that all those things are transferred appropriately. Okay, because it, seem, it seems to me that the, the issue is less of a, I mean, I, I, you know, we, we've all seen the Measure Y language. I mean, maybe it's not as, user-friendly and clear as we would like, but I, but I think it's all there. The issue to me seems less of a policy issue and more of a practical day-to-day. -day. If I'm a manager, do I know, uh, yes, I should pay for this with Measure Y funds versus, uh, no, I should pay for this with property tax funds, or I should pay for this and let the CFO decide which portion gets allocated. Um, it sounds like we're not going to be able to solve that until we have a CFO in place. Is that right? That, that would be my preference, so that that person, you know, is brought into the, the into the fold right from the get go with with this type of issue. Um, but generally, it's not up to the managers to decide how things are paid. They they have uh, their the codes are assigned to them, and and they they would input that information into the into the documents. Okay, so it's so if 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 I'm a manager, I'm approving the expense. I'm not necessarily thinking about which bucket is it coming out of. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, Deborah, I see you nodding. Did you want to add something? No. no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, now, and and Randy, to to follow up on this, while I understand that. In, in, in effect, what it sounds like is that you would be providing on a regular basis to division managers uh, information that, lo was, that looked more or less like what we saw in the budget workbook, right? They would be seeing their own uh, expense totals on a regular basis. Is that correct? 
Yes. Yep. I would use that that summary page in the budget workbook as the starting point for the the new format. Yeah. Um. And, and, but this, but the same information would still roll up to us at a summary level, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um. Okay. This is this sounds great. Um. Any further comments? Questions? Um. um. I just have, would like to reinforce my earlier comment. I'm new on the finance committee, but the more I learn about the county system, the better I like it. And I feel that maybe we ought to have Randy at some point, not now, <laughs> tell us what else he can do that he hasn't told us. <clears throat> <So>. <laughs> okay, uh, du duly noted. Um, so let, let's let's move on to um, item 5.6. And um, before we jump in here, just a reminder: this today this is a discussion item. Um, but what I hear Barbara saying is that our goal, uh, not to be accomplished at today's meeting, is going to be to document this as a policy. So. Um, um, Ann, I'm going to turn it over to you and, and ask you to um, kind of lead us in, in terms of what you would like to see uh, at the director level. Well, I think the, um, the moving toward more of a character-based budget uh, is a great start. Um, if I can have the flexibility to, to move funds within a division, um, that is huge. It's very helpful. Um, so for example, you know, if, if you were running over in one, one portion in services and supplies in facilities, we might be able to shift a few things around to, to make sure that we get what we need to do accomplished without uh, having to come back to, the, back to the commission for a budget adjustment. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure what more we could do as a public agency to, to make to make things more flexible. Randy, what are what are other departments doing that that we might learn from? Generally, it's exactly as you just described. Um, all mm -hmm. departments have the ability to move budget within the same character um, at their discretion. Um, okay. It's when you you. you start looking into having to get external approval when you want to move money between characters mm -hmm. or if you want to actually do an overall increase to the, the budget which that kicks up yes. to the uh, to the board level or the, to the commission level that would need to right. approve that but otherwise department heads do have the discretion to move line item uh, budgets around within characters um, as they see fit and that's within characters within each division or overall for the department? Generally, it's at the fund level. Yeah, the, okay. the, we don't have appropriation control in the county um, at the division level. It's always at the fund level. Okay, that's very helpful. So, um, and I apologize because I don't have the budget workbook in front of me. And from your perspective, what are the divisions that, uh, that, that you, you know, see when you look out at the library as a whole? Well, that would be the, the divisions that we have in, in OMT. So example, we've got IT, we've got public services, facilities, HR, um, communications, fund development, collections. Uh, those are the divisions that we operate within the library. And so what, what I'm uh, I, I just I just want to I just want to do this with a specific example to make sure that I'm you know I'm I'm getting it because what what I believe I'm, I'm hearing you say is that all divisions have the ability to move budget within the same character. So if I'm uh, if if I'm Mike Mike Daw and I'm managing IT. Mm -hmm. I've got a service and supplies budget. Now I've got individual line items, but as long as I'm maintaining my total expenses within the overall service and supplies budget, 
I can move funds between individual line items. Is that correct? I believe I can move those funds. I'm not sure that, that the division managers can, but yeah, oh, that's the okay. idea. Okay, yeah, but, the, but you can, or, or mm -hmm. Mike could with your approval. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, Thank you for that caveat, and I, I think we do want some control. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, uh, see, and, and here's where I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit unclear because what I think I'm hearing you say is, uh, again, I'm, I'm not trying to put Mike on the spot, but it just, I, you just came to mind. So I'm, I'm Mike, I'm managing the IT budget. I have you know, different line items for services and supplies. If I actually approve something that takes me above the budgeted amount for a specific line item, there's no control in the county in the county's accounting system that makes that impossible. It's not like a tripwire that goes on. You can't do mm -hmm. that because what I thought I heard Randy say was that in fact, as long as the library as a whole doesn't exceed its budgeted expenses, the county's accounting system will not be any kind of uh, control there. And did, did I understand that right, Randy? Yes, that, that's 100% correct. The, the control is at the fund level and all the all divisions make up the fund. So you're, you're right. You could actually mm -hmm. set up the budget within a division and no red flags, no alarm bells go off at the, at the, within the accounting system it's, itself. It would be, again, something that needs to be um, looked at internally. Yeah, so, so Anne, in terms of, of how things are done currently, what, what would you say is the management policy about this if, if, I'm, you know, if I'm Mike or any of the other division mm -hmm. managers? Do I need your approval to go if my budget exceeds any line item or only if it exceeds like services and supplies? I think that it hasn't really been a question up until now because they have not been getting those reports on their budget. That was something that our last CFO, Jody Frost, was just starting to produce for them. And I think if they can get regular reports to show where, where their spending is, um, that will be extremely helpful. And then we can have those conversations as we go through the year and say, okay, pay attention because you're getting really close to your limit here. Think about, do we need to move some money around or, or how would you like to handle that? And it, it'll be a much healthier um, situation for, for the library as a whole and for, for me and for, for all of the team members to have that, that knowledge. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say, and this makes sense to me, and I, I just, it's helpful because I, it kind of sequences things, right? Until mm -hmm. we're able to provide um, department heads, division managers with timely and accurate information, it, it we, we, doesn't make sense to have a policy because there's no way to, uh, to control it. Um, Right. Uh, once we have that, then I, I think we've got to continue this discussion um, and, and, and uh, develop a policy. You know, what do you want the policy to be internally as far as what mm -hmm. flexibility you want your division heads to have? And then mm -hmm. um, what, what we in turn, you know, would uh, feel comfortable with having you do. Does that make sense? Yep, that sounds fine. Barbara? Yeah, since we passed the budget, um, and it was a pretty uh, difficult meeting for me to go through. Again, I didn't feel like I understood this concept of flexibility. And I guess I am starting to understand a little bit more. So I've done some research, I've done some online research and I've had a couple of conversations with people. One of the examples of why you would want to have a policy, for example, is the ability to move things around 
is one thing. The ability to add or delete positions would be something that, for example, we would have in our policy that would come to the commission level. Mm -hmm. So money can be moved around about certain things, but certain things could not be done, for example, eliminating positions or adding positions. So that's the kind of detail that I think we need to have in this policy. Now, you bring up a good point, Andy, whether we can, whether we're prepared to develop the policy at this point or not, but I don't want to like lose it because we have adopted a budget with this concept of flexibility, but none of us are really quite clear, I don't believe still in a written way, what that actually means. So we've kind of jumped off into a, a new world and I don't think we quite have the backup to the transparency of, of what it actually means. Well, so we, Barbara, I think, can we, I, can like, I, I think can we could I? write part of the policy, um, the, you know, the policy that we're talking about moving money around in the division level, and then we can add to it as we develop some more things that we think of, including an issue about adding or deleting positions. Thank you. Well, can I ask a question about that? I mean, and, and maybe I'm completely off base here, but are you saying that other agencies, uh, that the commission or governing body has to approve uh, if a position is added or? Uh... Yeah. Absolutely. Any uh, runner park, I just, you know, runner park city council, they is part of the budget hearing. You have to, the govern, the governing body approves positions because it's a permanent expense, ongoing expense. Is that something that we as a commission have ever done in the past? Well, I believe we have. That's I mean, we right. just, mm -hmm. as we all know, just approved the position for the, the assistant director and oh. In the past, we've had different discussions about it. The big discussion came out the year we had Measure Y passed, and we had, you know, this you know large amount of money suddenly that we were able to, to think about. A lot of these positions kind of came up, and we had a lot of discussion about whether, you know, item by item, you know, position by position, we would, we would adopt them. <laughs> the last couple of years, our budget discussions have been obviously very influenced by you know factors out of our control. But as we move forward, these are kind of things to me that you would have each division make, you know, discuss what's going on, request the additional positions and so forth. But it should come to us as the governing body. I believe that's our responsibility. I, I, I don't know if I, uh, I'm, just, I'm just processing this. I, I, it, to me, it made sense that as a commission, we needed to approve the assistant director role because that's an executive leadership role. But if, uh, if, if Anne were to determine that we needed to increase staffing at a branch by, by hiring a part-time or full-time employee, uh, I don't know that I would feel comfortable needing to approve that at the commission level. Well, I think it's, that's the discussion, right? Maybe they, the policy is we don't have to discuss discuss, you know, there's, there's flexibility for part-time positions, but not for executive positions or something. Well, we just, we just don't have a policy on it right now at all. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, it, it sounds like this is going to be an ongoing discussion, but, but Anne, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you not, you know, not to put you on the spot today, but um, I, I, I'm going to ask you to please kind of guide us to where you would like to be. I, I'd like to at least know what from, you know, you have years of experience in, in library leadership, what, what you feel makes sense as an appropriate level of not just scrutiny, but support, right? Because if we're approving things that uh, presumably gives you a uh, cover uh, with regard to public scrutiny um, and what you feel sh should appropriately be within your discretion. And I think we should be having those discussions as Randy and his team are implementing the kind of timely reporting that would enable us to really put that into effect. Is that something you'd be comfortable in doing? Yes, I'd be happy to. Okay. So I'm going to... We do have uh, Commissioner Cahill and Randy Seifel with their hands raised. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Well, I can't see that at all. Dave, I apologize. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, this is going to be a learning experience. We're all going to have to be patient with each other because this is, as people have said, a whole new world. I know we're running out of time here because we've got to get to the CalPERS presentation. And just a couple of things for you to think about slash worry about. Um, uh, let's, I'm looking at an example here, our favorite project, the archives. In, in your report of, to us of the 11th, you said, I'll need to come back to you for a budget amendment uh, to finish up this stuff. I expect you will be under $200,000. So you're saying you think we, the commission has to have this done by budget amendment, okay? Then on the report for the 18th, then you're talking about, and the facts may have changed, but then you say, what little else is needed, I can reallocate from line items within the facilities or collections budgets. Thank you for approving that flexibility. So when you're doing your 10-page <laughs> paper, it would be nice for us to know, you know, where the lines are drawn, like where you think it would be most effective for you to be able to transfer things and where you think really you ought to come back to us for budget amendments. Um, and then the other thing is, what about telling us when you do these exercises of flexibility, how a reporting requirement would work most effectively for you. That's all. Okay. Thanks. Um, Randy, I apologize. I see you have a hand up also. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted a, a point of clarification on the, the, the positions question. The, the way it works with the county is that every department has certain positions allocated to them. Um, and this is the same pro same philosophy used with, with libraries. So when, when we're looking at, does the commission need to approve a new position? They only need to approve a position that's not already part of that allocation. Because in other words, if you're asking for a new position that's not in that original mm -hmm. allocation, you're asking for additional budget, additional money to be spent. And mm -hmm. that's why those positions have to be approved by the commission. Otherwise, if it's just a vacant position within the already approved allocation list, then Anne has, um, you know, she has the ability to fill those positions when she's ready to. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm accustomed to from, from other libraries. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, first of all, thanks to everybody for their comments. This is going to be coming on, become an ongoing discussion. And I'm, I'm just going to ask everybody to please keep in mind that, that we're going to continue to see a distinction between what our policy is or what we want it to be and what controls the county's accounting system actually provides because those are not necessarily going to be the same thing and to remember that the county's uh, you know accounting system provides control at the fund level it may be our policy that we want um, and and her managers and the commission to exercise control at different levels. Okay, and now we're gonna move on to uh, item 5.7. And uh, I'm gonna stop talking and uh, <laughs> it, 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 and do you have some introductions for us here with folks from CalPERS? Sure, we have uh, Jean McDonald here and uh, Jean, you have a, another staff member with you as well? Yes, I have my colleague uh, Karen Lukenbell on the call with us today, and she's going to go ahead and present uh, the SEPT Pension Prefunding Trust Program uh, to your finance committee. And we wanted to thank you all for allowing us the time today to present this for you. Um, well, I, I, Jean and Karen, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to ask you to to explain this to us, and I'm going to ask you to please keep in mind that we are not necessarily familiar with some of the acronyms that mm -hmm. appear. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to kind of start at Pension 101 for us. So please mm -hmm. take it away. Sure. sure. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity. So Jean and I, we are part of CalPERS, but our program is small. It is called the pre-funding programs. And in these two pre in these pre-funding programs, we actually have two trust funds or investment funds available. 
Uh, we studied it in 2007. One is called the OPEB Trust Fund. In 2007, we established it 14 years ago. The library is actually participating in this trust fund already. So you've been here for, I believe, more than six years. And before I actually talk about pension, I wanted to share some good news, provide an update to you on how you're participating in this investment fund or trust fund. So that's one of the program. Another trust fund is what we call the CEPT, the CEPPT, the California Employers Pension Prefunding Trust. It's another investment vehicle. It is another trust fund. It is only for employers, so agencies, not members, so that um, you can invest more and earn more earnings or income. Uh, next slide. I forgot, I'm not uh, sharing the screen. Okay. Um, here, I wanted to talk about uh, what are currently your pension liabilities. Um, so let's take a step back. Why do you have pension liabilities? So the library participates in a defined um, retirement or benefit system. They participate in CalPERS. So these are promised benefits that when the employees retire, CalPERS being the retirement fund will issue the checks, the retirement benefits to these employees. Now, as part of that benefit, um, the employee and the employer pays into the retirement fund. The member or the employee pays a percentage of um, the payroll each uh, month, whatever is coming out of their pay slip. For you, for the library, you are legally mandated to send in two types of contributions. So the first is, it's not here, but I want to talk about the first contribution is what you call the normal cost contribution. It is a percentage of payroll. It is related to the active employees currently of the library. And then the second one is the UAL payment. UAL stands for Unfunded Accrued Liability. Um, it is a, a payment that is amortized over a long period of time. I, I believe in yours could be decades of time that you pay in to CalPERS. And it's, uh, it's because you're not fully funded. You don't have enough monies in the retirement system that is equivalent to what the pension liability or the benefit uh, amount would be. So let's take a look here. You have one plan. The retirement plan is the miscellaneous plan. If you look at the funding level, right, you are eight, more than 80% funded, meaning if there is an amount of your liability, the assets that you have in the retirement system is 80% uh, of that liability. So which means that whatever is the difference, that is the unfunded amount. So people refer to it as your pension debt. So this is the amount, $14 million is how much the library needs to catch up to so that you can say that I am 100% funded when it comes to my pension. Now this 14 million, because it is amortized over several years. So if we look at it as a big pizza pie, right? We cut it into slices and each year you pay a certain slice. Uh, we wanted to show you here that for fiscal year 22, so meaning next fiscal year, and we're about to wrap up this fiscal year, you're going to send CalPERS a UAL payment of 1.3 million dollars, 1 million, dollars And fast forward five years by fiscal year and 27, that will be $1,333,000. So there's a $32,000 difference. So you, these amortization payments are either that amount or it could potentially gradually increase for the library. So knowing that you must pay these um, required payments, um, the question is, um, is it status quo? Do we just continue to pay for all of these required mandatory payments from our general fund? Or are there alternatives out there? It does, and CalPERS does provide an alternative, which allows you to earn more investment income so that you might get into a position in the future when it's time to pay for all of these required bills, whether it's on year five, year 10, 15, et cetera. 
not everything will come from your general fund. Now you will have the opportunity to use whatever investment earnings that have you've gained or realized from this 115 trust that we're trying to present to you. Um, next Karen, I'm gonna stop you if I may, because I've got mm -hmm. a couple of questions. Sure. Um, of course, as I understand it, we're at about 80% of where we should be. Mm -hmm. And to be at 100%, we would need to have $14 million more in our fund. Is that correct? Yes. If you want to be fully funded in the Cowboys retirement system in your account, you need to send in $14 million more. So I see that you show, you show a payment in 2021-22. You also show a payment, you know, five years in the future, but mm -hmm. to cover $14 million, we would need to be paying like 1.3 million for the next 11 years, right? Yes. And in fact, you're going to be paying more, uh, Chair Andy, because uh, it is like getting a loan, right? Whenever you owe something where you're in debt, every time you don't pay the full amount, like credit card debt, you are charged an interest rate. So whatever is your amortization time frame, right? If it's spread over 20 years, 25 years, or 18 years, we add in a 7% interest rate. So it does get expensive, not only for the library, but for a lot, for majority of California public agencies, it becomes more and more challenging to plan for. You know that there is a debt, Right. Uh, you always want to find out what is there another way? Are there more prudent tools available so that you know it's easier for us in the future to pay for this debt? Okay, thank you. I see Barbara McKenzie has her hand up also. Yeah, I just want to establish one basic factor. The the Cal of uh, the Pagalbers Trust that I know we have is for our OPEB, not for CalPERS not for the CalPERS repent the pension thing. And I just, which numbers are you using? Are you talking about the OPEB trust we already have? Sorry, this is not the OPEB trust. I thought I have a slide. I apologize for that. But I do have a slide for your OPEB trust. So this is totally different. This okay. is the pension yes, funding gotcha. trust. Okay. And um, your assets there, I believe it's about almost $8 million now in your OPEB trust. That is firewalled. It's not commingled with any other. That is uh, the library's assets specific to your OPEB or retiree healthcare. I just wanted to make sure we we're talking about, okay, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what I'm not seeing here, but what I, I'm sort of doing the math, this $14 million represents the 19.3% the that we're short. Yes. Right? So mm -hmm. what that means is we have something like in the, on the order of $56 million in the fund, but we, yeah. need, we should have a higher amount. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Apologies. Right. Yes, oh, no, don't worry about it. Yes, so you do have assets in the trust because you have, you know, that's 80.7% already in the retirement fund. Um, you know, but ideally, every agency would like to be at a higher funding level or would like to catch up to their debt. And especially if the retirement fund, and it is the same for all other in retirement funds, right? That not every year it uh, achieves the 7% discount rate set by, for example, for CalPERS. So every year that that 7% um, investment return does not happen, it means that there is a deficit or shortfall that actually gets paid by, again, the employers. So you all share in that um, payment of that underperformance. So that's where the volatility comes in. If you're expecting, I'm only going to pay 1.3 million in the next X number of years, but guess what? Last year, we did not hit 7%, we'd hit 4.7%. And the year previous to that, it was 6.7%. So each year of underperformance, you will eventually see that being charged back to the employers. So next slide. Oh, Chair Andy, I do see a hand. Do you want me to just continue? I, I saw a hand raised. Randy. Um, 
Is that you, Tom? Uh, no, Who's Randy okay. has his hand up. I don't know if he. Was, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that might yeah. be just a leftover. Yeah. All right. That's just. A, so, that's just. A I'm sorry. All right. Thank you. So here, I wanted to talk about. Um, <laughs> remember, we were talking about a 14 million dollar um, pension debt. If you want to send an entire 14 million dollars, you fully caught up with your debt. But in reality your schedule of payment is 20 years. So you're paying us that 14 million in 20 years. So in 20 years time, you are going to send us $23 million, not 14, because we charge you interest for that. You know, so out of that $23 million, 9.4 is actually interest. Now you have an option here. Now this is not part of our program, but it is always good to know that if you decide to shorten the amortization time frame, it's like a, a in a personal life. If you have a mortgage for a house, it's a thirty year term. If you want to do it fifteen years, you know that you will get a you will get a discount, right? I mean, it will um, uh, it's going to increase your payment <laughs> the next fifteen years, but the interest payments overall is smaller. So it's the same case here on your valuation report. If you look at the last slide, if you want to collapse that into 10 instead of 20 years, you're essentially paying us $18.9 million. The interest is only $5.2 million. You've saved the library about $4.2 million of interest payments. There's always the, the caveat, the catch here is of course, when you shorten the time frame, you would have to pay more. And one example here is just for one year payment alone next year, if you look at column four here, you have to send more than uh, half a million dollars to whatever is required. So whatever is required next year, it has to be plus 585,000. So, you know, these are your options here, but not everybody can afford it. Right? Not everyone would have that financial muscle. All right, <laughs> 20 years to 10 years, because if you already have projected your budget for, for the next several years, somehow you want to stick to that kind of budget. So next slide. So what are the tools that you can use at CalPERS? So you can do two things. We believe that having these two tools in your toolbox to add to the mix. It's not going to uh, be the 100% um, uh, solution for everything because you always believe that you would have your different goals that you might be using different strategies, but we like for you to consider these two things. Number one, which is I think is the most impactful and powerful for the library is you, you can send ADPs, it says additional discretionary payments. So these are what you call voluntary or lump sum payments to chip away that $14 million of pension debt. So yes, do it if you can afford it. But again, not a lot of um, agencies would have a huge amount of reserve fund. The ADP is the best way um, to catch up to the debt faster. It really does make up for the underperformance. But you also need to combine it with having a 115 trust for pension. So you already have one for OPEB. It is very similar. It is another investment fund that will earn much better than where you keep your money now, if it is in LAFE or in the county pool or treasury or in a money market account. So that when these required bills come due, you have a lot of options. You pay a portion from your general fund and you also get to enjoy all of the investment earnings that you have uh, enjoyed or experienced from the 115 trust. So the 115 trust does really help you prepare for, for the future. So next slide. So why pre-fund through a 115 trust? I wanted to share that this is a voluntary optional program like your OPEB trust, but we are seeing more and more agencies sign in and opt to do this because for them, they are realizing that the pension required payments, these pension costs are increasing much faster than their budget is growing. But, but there are employers out there that are fortunate that they can say this fiscal year all the way till the next 10 to 15 years, 
we're good. Our budget can afford it. But what we're hearing actually is a lot of agencies saying, oh, it's going to be tough, especially if there's a volatility in these contributions. Even if it will steady realize, uh, steadily rise, if there is a way for us to supplement our income from other sources, let's talk about it. You also want an opportunity to outperform LAIF or county treasury. So therefore this 115 trust is a great alternative for you. Next slide. Um, excuse me, Karen, what is LAIF, L-A-I-F? It's Local Agency Investment Fund. So it is another investment vehicle um, I believe is the state of California, but it's a different agency from us, not CalPERS. It might be the, um, the state treasurer's office that offers leave. So a lot of agencies, they use it for their general fund. Uh, it is low risk, extremely low risk, but the yield is also much lower because I believe it's not a very well diversified portfolio. It might be similar to uh, a money market account or the county treasury. So how can you use this 115 <coughs> pension? You use it so that you can grow your assets for all of your future pension contribution. So remember, you do have two required payments to send CalPERS. Uh, normal cost is a perpetual cost that you would have to pay. It's like paying your electric bill, right? You cannot get out of it. So you will continually pay the normal cost. It is attached to payroll. So if your payroll continues to increase in the future, therefore that normal cost amount will also steadily rise. And then second, you can use it to pre-fund that pension debt, that UAL, unfunded um, accrued liability for pension. There are so many different ways to use this trust. You know that this is always less risky than the CalPERS retirement system. It is still conservative like your county treasury or your general fund investments. You use it to stabilize your budget, especially if you think that your budget will be flat in the future, but your required CalPERS pension payments continue to creep up, continue to increase. And you can treat it as a contingency reserve fund in case there is an emergency <coughs> difficult times ahead. So you can liquidate from this trust, very similar to how the, your OPEB trust operates too. Next slide. Let's talk about the participation. I know you have many relationships with us, with CalPERS. Uh, with your OPEB trust, and with this pension pre-funding trust, they have very similar funding policy flexibility. Here you are in the driver's seat, you have full control. So no one in our team, Gene and I will not uh, make recommendations, will not influence you how you want to participate or how you want to uh, behave. You have options where to invest. If you are conservative, then you, there is an investment portfolio for you. If you want high growth, there is also an investment portfolio for you. Now contributions are purely voluntary, they're never required. So when you join the trust, it does not mean that you are required to make a contribution. You join the trust because you want to set up an account, similar to how you did it in the <laughs> trust six years ago. You can also reimburse from this trust. So there is liquidity in this trust, even though it is irrevocable, meaning it is dedicated strictly for pension payments, you can still withdraw or liquidate from your trust account. Next slide. So how can you use it? If you want to look at it as a contingency reserve fund and you're thinking, well, how do we fund it? How much money should we fund it? Again, because we say that um, the participation is up to you, you can put whatever amount that you have in there. You can put $1 or if you have a surplus at the end of the year, from what we have seen with other agencies in our trust, we do have a, a couple of um, libraries already in the SEPT, in the Pension Pre-Funding Trust. You know, they're looking at different approaches. Some would look at how much is my pension bills each year? So they would put a portion of that or the entire one year. So it really is up to you how much you can afford to put here. Your three months pension payments is about $680,000. So if you have that reserve amount, 
and you want it to earn more than county treasury or your general fund investments, consider putting that or a portion of that in this trust. Next slide. Or you can use it for purpose number two, just to truly pre-fund future pension costs in advance. Because you know that the normal cost uh, is a perpetual fee. You can always look at that as a target. Look at pre-funding normal cost in year five or onwards. Or if you're trying to um, chip away at that pension debt of $14 million, you can actually build that ADP, that additional discretionary payment, or that voluntary payment in this fund rather than keep it in your general fund. So just take advantage, let time be your friend, take advantage of that compounding interest. Next slide. So again, speaking of the compounding interest model, we wanted to simplify it for you, but again, in a perfect world, right? If you participate in one of our conservative investment portfolios, for example, the 5% um, strategy one, what we're seeing here on this slide is given enough time, if you put money into the trust, you don't draw down or you don't take money into the trust. And assuming it compounds at a 5% interest rate each year. So over 11 years, you would have enough investment earnings. So let's use the $1 as an example at the bottom of this row, right? If you give us 58 cents today and you let it sit for 11 years, right? Um, Assuming you do not withdraw from that 58 cents, in 11 years, you would have generated 42 cents, the 5% compounding <coughs> of a dollar after 11 years. I know I'm just talking about cents and dollars here, but if you add several zeros here, it's the same. It's exactly very similar to uh, what you are experiencing in your OPEB trust, that you keep putting money into that trust, you never touch it, and it has grown for the library. Next slide. So here is an example. This is, for example, a normal cost uh, contribution. What we're saying here is, and this is not specific to the library, just in a scenario, an example for any agency, they can target specific years, right? If you think for this agency, this employer in fiscal year 29, they need to send, let's say $27 million or $260,000 to CalPERS by that year. Well, what can they do now? If they have $18.2 million or $180,000 today, let it sit there for eight years, then they would have enough funds, their initial contribution and the investment gains or investment earnings to pay for the required CalPERS normal cost payment that year. So these are just some examples, and these are all just illustration and scenario for you. Next slide. So here we wanted to talk about what are you, your two investment options should you decide to participate in the SEP trust. So currently you have a general fund that most likely sits in the county treasury. So we are a fan of that because it is low risk. You're seeing it in the rightmost column. You are also participating in the retirement fund, which is the CalPERS pension. It is a long-term investment. The investment return there is 7% <coughs> year investment return, but it is also the most risky out of um, the options here. So we wanted something in between. It's like a sweet spot. We wanted to offer you something conservative, but will outperform your general fund investments and not as risky as a CalPERS retirement fund. Next slide. So this is the reason why we're able to offer a higher investment return. It's because it is a more diversified portfolio. So if you choose strategy one or two, or if you choose both, your dollars will be invested in these public market asset classes in column one. And the real difference is just on percentages. So if you want to be in the most conservative option, you can see that there is a high allocation to fixed income in strategy two, less in global equity or stocks. And then there's a different allocation for strategy one. Next slide. 
we wanted to show you our report card. So these are the actual investment returns as of April 30 for the two trust funds. So the top portion is your is the OPEB trust, the one that you are already participating in. And you can see the returns as short as one month return, investment return. And if you look at the rightmost column, it is ITD or the inception to date investment return. The pension pre-funding trust, the one that we're offering you this afternoon uh, for your consideration is at the bottom here, you can see the returns there as well. It was established in 2019. Therefore, we only have a, a one year return. We don't have a three, five or 10 year return for set the bottom portion. Next slide. So in terms of fees charts, being a public agency like you, no one has a commission in our team. We cannot retain a profit. Therefore, we can only charge based on what we need to operate the program. So we've been charging a very low fee rate for your OPEB trust, it's 10 basis points. For your SEP, it's 25 basis points. To simplify it, 10 basis point is 0.1% and 25 is 0.25%. So for every $1 million, and, and the annual fee is uh, $1,000 if it's 0.1% and $2,500 if it's 25 basis points or 0.25%. Next. So what are the advantages of uh, the program? Um, first, you know we are very thankful and honored that you are already pre-funding OPEB uh, with our trust, with the Retirement, retiree Benefit Trust Fund. Please know that we would love to earn your business and would love for the library to consider also participating in the SEPT, the Pension Prefunding Trust Fund. We offer these five unique advantages that we know the others cannot provide. Uh, the investment policy and the management services is performed by CalPERS and we have been in the retirement fund uh, management for more than 85 years. And being a public agency, having no profit embedded in our cause, we know that we truly can offer the lowest participation fee rate out there. Jean and I, uh, the, yes? I have a, a couple of questions here with regard to investment standards. Sure. You have a, an ambiguous statement here, or at least an unclear statement. No socially conscious divestment. Yes. Um, my concern is that it acts like you are not gonna uh, respond to a complaint that an investment is not socially conscious by getting rid of it. Um, my, our big deal here in Sonoma County with the Sonoma County Treasurer's Office, they have a new policy and it goes through the typical standards of liquidity and security, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then it adds this, whenever possible and consistent with the above standards, investment opportunities will be evaluated for social and environmental impacts. The intent of this policy is to create positive impacts by investing in socially and environmentally responsible agencies and corporations as defined by our board of supervisors. I don't wanna give this up. If you're saying that you don't do social consciousness, I'm not sure we can go down this road. Got it. Thanks, David, for that update, but you are correct. So the CalPERS Retirement Fund, I believe in 2016, um, uh, already formalized that they will um, divest, right? But this, the SERPT and the SEPT funds cannot afford to do that because it is a fund of funds. So we ask State Street Global Advisors. So these are a totally separate trust fund um, that is not commingled with the pension fund. Okay, so, so if I'm understanding you, uh, you go uh, by the uh, sort of capitalism, red and tooth and claw investment kind of strategy. You see no problem with investing in fossil fuel companies or other uh, things that are harmful to the environment. This is just part of the program. If Because if I can just, I, if you can move to the two slides before, because our investment policy and philosophy is by design. Can, can you move one more? Sorry. Here uh, um, is 
for us to mimic or emulate these industry standard benchmarks, the MSCI All Country World Index, this is how we are investing. It's 99 to 100% exactly like, for example, MSCI ACQUI. So if MSCI ACQUI is composed of 8,000 to 9,000 holdings, regardless if it's socially conscious or not, we will emulate those. So we cannot deviate from the MSCI ACQUI. Or for our fixed income sleeve, it is going to be exactly like the Bloomberg Barclays US Aggregate Bond Index. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So it is not a unique uh, investment portfolio. And thank you for that. Now, in, just to wrap it up, the customer service, we are a big team in CalPERS, 3,000 employees, but Jean and I are part of a program with only 13 people. So we know, and you have our commitment that we are very lean, we are nimble, we respond quickly to all requests and to all questions. Um, we want to make sure that this is very simple to join and participate in our program. And last would be just GASB compliance. We both are highly scrutinized public agencies, so we need to make sure that we comply with all of the regulations, laws, as well as the governmental accounting standards. Uh, next slide. This is how many agencies we have currently in our trust, a total of 593 pre-funding program employers. The OPIB Trust, where you are participating in, we have 584 agencies there. For the Pension Pre-Funding Trust, more and more agencies are joining. We have 35 pre-funding programs there. Majority of our employers are special districts, so 323. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to briefly talk about ADPs. If in the future you're planning to send an ADP, if you've amassed a big reserve and want to wipe out that $40 million debt, the first thing I wanted to share is um, you need to work with your CalPERS pension actuary so that they can make recommendations um, for you. Um, if you can dollar cost average it, in, instead of being sending one big lump sum, maybe think of sending it in several installments so that there is less volatility uh, that you will experience. And next slide. So this would be our contact information. You will see my information there as well as Jean. You can contact us in so many different uh, ways, either email, our desk lines, our mobile numbers. Um, we really thank you for this opportunity to provide an overview of this program at CalPERS. You hope that the library will also consider setting up an account here, just like how you set up your OPIB trust with us. Thank you. Are there any more questions, by the way? Yes, I, Karen, I have some questions. First of all, sure. thank I want to thank you and Jean, first of all, for being here, for putting together this presentation for us and taking the time to walk through it. Um, uh, Jaylene, could we go back to just the third slide, please, which is going to be page 21 of the packet? I, I'm going to try to replay what I heard you say, and I want you to correct me where I have misunderstood something, okay? Um, sounds like we're currently only 80% funded in terms of our liability. And this means that we need to make a normal payment, plus we need to make what you were referring to as a UAL, or unfunded accrued liability payment. And the way this is set up, if we do nothing, is that you've got us on a 20-year amortization schedule. Is that correct? Correct. Um, so we're going to be paying down this $14 uh, million that we owe over 20 years. We're being charged 7% interest. And if we do nothing but comply, over the course of that uh, 20 year period, 
we'll end up paying not, not 14 million, which is what we owe now, but a total of 23 million, which would include 14 million plus $9 million in interest. And of course, that's, that's in addition to the normal payments that we're making as we go along. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So one idea that you're sharing, and I know this is not the purpose of your presentation, but one idea that you're sharing with us is to say, you know, if you pay this debt down more quickly, you're going to save money in terms of the interest that you pay. So, for example, if we said, hey, we, we want to try to accelerate this and instead of paying it off over 20 years, we're going to pay it off over 15 years. We would have to. Um, pay an additional $153,000 a year, but the net net would be that we'd end up saving 1.2 million over the course of funding our, our liability. And, and if we were even more aggressive, if we said, wow, instead of 20 years, we wanna pay this off in 10 years. Well, we'd have to make a much bigger payment um, but net net, we end up saving four point two million dollars in interest. Is that right? Correct. But I wanted to clarify that extra one hundred fifty three k and or five eighty five k is only for year one. So you need to look at it's. Uh, I think it's on page nineteen of your valuation on year two. How much is the difference? Because in some valuation reports, I have seen that by year seven. Your, your variable payment actually could be higher than the level payment. It's not here, unfortunately. It's in the actual valuation report. So uh, Barbara, I know you have a question, but I'm, I'm not, please bear with me. Um, so, Although you shared this slide, this isn't really what you're advocating. What you're really advocating is if we have, if we have the ability to pay more than the minimum UAL payment, what you're suggesting is that we put that into a trust, which you'll manage, um, and then use the funds that are accumulated at some point to pay down our unfunded liability. Is that right? Correct. Uh, but in fact, the first recommendation is not even in our trust. If you right. can send it directly to um, CalPERS, um, you know, you do that. Even though it's not my program, I really think it's in everyone's best interest that we share with you what are all of the available options you have at CalPERS. I wouldn't be doing my job if I just talk about my product, knowing that you can also do this and you can also, you know, do this too. Well, so, and, and I understand that there are some benefits in terms of dollar cost averaging and timing of payment, but it looked to me that if we just made an additional discretionary payment, we're paying down interest that we are paying at 7%, whereas the return on the trust is either four or 5%, depending on which portfolio we choose. So I, I guess I'm, I'm a little unclear. Uh, I, I appreciate you drawing our attention to the fact that we can bring down our, our, uh, our total payments, but if we can't project our revenues out many years in advance, not clear to me why you would be strongly advocating that we set up the trust as opposed to just making additional payments. Well, it really is not, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate that. A lot of uh, the feedback that we're receiving is something similar to that. Um, what I wanted to share, it's not one or the other. It is best if you do both because the thing with an ADP the only downside of an additional discretionary payment is zero liquidity. So imagine if you um, were able to come up with $5 million, right? And then you send it to the pension fund. And but the next year or the next two years, you realize that um, 
there might be you know some emergencies you realize oh i cannot come return to calpers and can you give me like 1 million of that 5 million dollars back because it is zero liquidity but you can do it with a trust if you want the dollar cost average if you have 5 million dollars maybe you want to send 3 million dollars today and then put some in the 115 trust and then when you're ready you can send it again to calpers as an adp but you realize that you have liquidity for example for uh, a portion of that. Right? Say, thank you. Uh, also, in terms of timing, um, I think, for example, this year, if the retirement fund is going to um, end at uh, hopefully double digit, right? Imagine if you can send a big amount of ADP this year and that will grow high, that will have a significant reduction to your pension debt. But what if also that you sent a big $5 million ADP, and then the next couple of months, the market also suffered another pandemic, right? You realize that the $5 million is now worth $4.5 million. So now you are, uh, you have less money than what you had from the beginning. So, you know, these are the things that you can, um, uh, you can consider, but we are also a big fan of sending in an ADP because it's really the fastest way to catch up to your debt. Thank you. Barbara? Was I ahead of, of you, Tom? I, I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. Hand. You go ahead, Barbara. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, after, when, after we passed Measure Y, we had the OPEB committee and we created the OPEB trust. Well, we actually pre created the OPEB policy. The trust had already been created, just didn't have much money in it. <clears throat> At that time, we also talked about doing this, creating a trust for CalPERS. I have had tremendous concern over CalPERS for a long time because I wa have watched Runner Park City Council deal with this for 24 years. And so I, we just didn't have enough money to, to do a trust for both to, you know, to fund the OPEB trust and also to start a new trust for, for the CalPERS. But we did hire a consultant. And we have a detailed uh, consultant report. I think it's about two years old about what our liabilities are gonna look like over time. I think it's over 20 years, I'm not sure. I think if one of the things I've learned about CalPERS, which is, you know, whatever it is, they, the discount rate is 7%. That, that means they expect to get 7% on their, on their earnings and they never do or rarely do. So always that difference comes back to the employer. The, always the employer has to pay the difference and whatever they, whatever they don't make, it's just, you know, goes on us specifically as, you know, as the, as the agency. So I, I would like us to, you know, pull that CalPERS report out in a general sense. I think it's always good to pay down debt. Um, you know, it's been one of my goals since, you know, I've been on the commission that are paid on our liabilities. Again, we have to be very careful about which of our employees are Measure Y employees. And so, you know, which fund balance we might be using to, to put in here and we'd need to keep records that somehow I, it's a question that's, you know, more complicated than I can address right now. But the, the, the main thing that I I want to say is that if the easy way to do this is to just, you know, pre-fund with payments as as we go it's a lot simpler than setting up a trust but i i'm all for the concept of paying down our liabilities thank you thanks tom um i have a question uh, barbara made a statement that calpers never makes it seven percent uh, interest return i guess it's not an interest it's rate of return on their investments that they, they posit. And I have in mind that they had it set at 7.75% a few years ago. Have they ever made the rate that they posit as their standard rate? Do you have records on that that show when that happened or when that didn't happen? Yes, I do have, I don't have, a, I guess I can pull up a slide right now. I think I have a, the last three years. The last two years we did not meet it. But the year before that, we did. So I do. The, I can share that power. Okay, but what I'm asking is, has has Calpers exceeded the seven percent or seven points of whatever their rate is yes. at any time in the last five years? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when that happens, does that mean that our debt goes down, our liability, our unfunded liability goes down? It does. It, it has an impact because all of those gains also, you experience that. But I believe based on... Okay, but I ask a specific question. Mm -hmm. If the return is higher than their stated rate, it's 8% or 9% or whatever, does that mean we will have a reduction in our unfunded liability? Um, I cannot answer that. It's so specific. The actuary can answer that because the way the gains and losses are spread, I don't think it is immediately in your next valuation. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you have uh, some kind of written material that you could provide to us that would explain this rather than just listening, reading the slideshow, which is very limited what's there and your explanations for this period of time we're here. Is there something we can get our hands on to, to do, look at this and better understand it? Sure. Are you talking about the uh, returns or the SEP, the Pension Prefunding Trust, like a, a summary? The whole presentation you made sure. today. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. mm -hmm. what, what, what is that? How would we get our hands on it? We can provide you, uh, we have a flyer that's typically shared with uh, board members. We also have our CalPERS agenda report that has a great overview, maybe two or three pages of uh, overview of the program. And if you're interested, maybe we can share with you uh, some staff reports from other agencies that have uh, um, shared this also with their council. For example, the city of Brenna Park is already in our trust. So maybe we can share that with you. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Do we have uh, any other questions? I'm checking to see uh, any hands raised. I don't see any. Okay. Any anybody want to make any final uh, remarks? I, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, did did Calpers approach us to, to make this presentation, or did somebody in staff suggest this, or was this an internal request? I. I actually called uh, Outbound and reached uh, Ann Hammond to notify her and give her an education on the pension prefunding trust. And because you're already in the CERT, which is the OPEB Healthcare Trust, um, I wanted to reach out to her and give her an education on our pension prefunding. Thank you. Any, any, any other questions? Um, well, again, I'd like to thank Karen. I think and there is the, a hand raised. Sorry, Chair Andy. Ray, I see Ray Holly. Oh, I'm sorry. Ray? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, Committee Chair Elkin and uh, Commissioners, Ray Holly. I wanted to harken back to my previous career um, <clears throat> writing about CalPERS. Uh, pension obligations for various uh, Sonoma County cities. And uh, I found it very valuable in the city of Healdsburg uh, as, a, as a citizen and as a journalist, it was very interesting when the city hired an outside actuary to come in, look at its pension obligation and make recommendations. As a result of doing that, instead of pre-funding CalPERS, which you can potentially can potentially cost you money when they underperform, uh, the city actually set up a separate pension trust, which is uh, performing well and is uh, uh, filling in the hills and valleys of uh, yearly uh, fluctuations. It's, I think it's very similar to what Commissioner McKenzie was discussing. So I, I wanted to add that bit of information. And I, I have the... Uh, contact information for the actuary that Healdsburg and other cities use. And I'm sure Barbara does for Runner Park as well. 
That's great. Thanks, Barbara. That's who we used. That's who the library used. We got that consultant from Yeltsburg. So we have a, a, a library report. I can dig it out, but I'm probably Jay Link put her hands on it too. But we have a consultant's report. We did not set up a trust because for, you know, we didn't go there, but we have this, uh, the actuarial report, the, the, that's what I was talking about. Do you, do you recall exactly what year that was done, Barbara? I think it was two years ago or more than or, that. Oh, three, maybe. Yeah. But it's or yeah. And I, I, I correct myself. It isn't that CalPERS never makes their earnings or their, you know, that discount rate, but they often miss it. And they've had to lower it because they used to have it as like this. Tom said 7.75 for a long time was 7.5. They've had to lower it because their returns have not met their, you know, their investment goals. So anyway, it's it's quote down to seven, but obviously like they 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 didn't make it last year or the year before. So again, that that adds to our costs. So right. Calper is a big concern. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to suggest. Um, Again, I want to thank uh, Karen and Jean. Thanks very much for joining thank us. Um, I'm going to suggest that as a uh, topic for next month, we do review the uh, actuarial report if somebody can find it. Um, Barbara, I see you raising your hand. You're on mute. Oh, I just, I'm sure I have it. I'll look for it. Okay. Um, I'm going to suggest that we find it and look at how current it is and that uh, we discuss whether it's time to commission another report um, with the uh, overall objective of making sure that uh, we are appropriately addressing the library's pension needs. And uh, I, Ray, I do appreciate you uh, bringing up your experience in the city of Healdsburg. I think we're going to have to, uh, you know, just as uh, as Karen was saying, I think we have to look at every available tool. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on what you've shared, I think we've got a good idea about the two that you and your team offer. So mm -hmm. thank you again for joining us. You're welcome. Um, uh, is there anything else that uh, uh, any uh, member of the committee would like to add to the upcoming meeting on July 19th as an agenda item. Barbara. Yes, I would. Um, I am looking at you know our budget. Uh, I was trying to get a copy of what we passed at the last meeting. If you go onto our website and then you at the bottom, it talks library commission and you click on that and then options come up for financial reports and you click on that and I print off the page. You get approved budget goes from 19 to 2019 to 2020. So our, our web page does not have an easily findable budget and that there's no reference to how you find it. So I, in, in the interest of transparency and of just, you know, maybe I don't know where I'm supposed to go, but I'm just as a member of the public trying to find our budget on the website, it is not easily accessible. And I, it's, I don't know if it's a topic for the finance committee, but it, since it is our budget document, I would like to get an update on our website and how, how to find that and how the public can find it in an easily accessible way. I suspect what happened was when we changed the way we did things and the recording of our, of our meetings and stuff, we changed something, but, but this is the page on the website that says financial reports and it is not up to date. That was one thing. And then I, I just, I'm like a broken record, but I do want to get a measure Y policy and talk about our allocations between property tax and sales tax, whether we put that on the back burner until we get a CFO, that's okay. But I just want to keep it on the, uh, the list of agenda items. Thank you. Okay. And I'm, and based on what you said, I'm thinking that that's something we should defer until we have a CFO. Is that your view? The policy, yes, yeah. I, would, I would prefer that, yes. But uh, regarding the budget on the website, you're absolutely right, Barbara. It's it's obscure to say the least, and we will take care of that. Uh, we've been working on 
website redesign, but we, this is a step we can take right now to, to make that, uh, that change. That would be great, thank you. Any other topics uh, for the next meeting? Uh, Deborah, are you raising your hand or are you just holding it near your camera? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, listen, I know we have, We've run uh, quite long on this meeting. I wanna thank everybody for their uh, focused attention and participation. Uh, I, it is my goal that future meetings will be 60 minutes or less. We had a lot to cover today. Uh, if you do think of something else specifically that you would like to cover next month, please let me know. Uh, and thanks to all, uh, let's adjourn at 5.05. Thank you. Stay well. Take care. And Erica, welcome.